Hi, I'm Brian Butko, Director of Publications at the Heinz History Center. And with us today is Jason Toger, the author of a book about the Murphy's Company, For the Love of Murphy's, we have right here. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Brian. Nice to be here. Glad to uh, have you and hope to learn a little bit about the company and uh, just what surprises you've brought along for us <laughs> today. Murphy's reminds me of a company that I wrote about, Isley's Dairy. Uh, although they weren't centered directly in Pittsburgh, they were uh, loved throughout the region, western Pennsylvania. They expanded beyond there and people to this day have such an affection for them that it's something in looking back uh, as a historian that's fascinating, uh, intriguing, and hard to, to wrap your hands around sometime. And I'm going to guess that maybe is uh, one of the reasons that you became interested in Murphy. What got me interested, uh, quite frankly, was I have two family connections. I have a grandmother who worked for the G.C. Murphy Company in the 1920s and 30s, mm. and I have another grandmother who worked for uh, a competing five and ten cent chain, mm -hmm. the McCrory Company. Oh, sure. uh, she worked there for about 30 years. Um, so I had grown up sort of going in and out of these stores mm -hmm. and hearing stories about these different dime stores. Um, what happened though actually was uh, someone from the Braddock's Field Historical Society uh, had been the general counsel for the G.C. Murphy Company, a man mm -hmm. by the name of Bob Messner. I knew Bob through the Historical Society and he came to me a few years ago and actually inspired by your Isley book, mm -hmm. asked mm -hmm. would I be interested in, in working on a G.C. Murphy mm -hmm. book, something similar. The, the dime store industry itself sort of got started in Pennsylvania. Uh, Woolworth, McCrory, Kresge, all these people got their start mm -hmm. in one way or another in Pennsylvania. One of the people who got their start in Pennsylvania in the dime store business working for the McCrory Company was George Clinton Murphy, mm -hmm. um, who was from Indiana County and had gone to work for his cousin John G. McCrory in a store in Jamestown, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually he decided to strike out on his own and when he did he opened his first independent for him, G.C. Murphy Company store mm -hmm. in McKeesport uh, around the turn of the 20th century, 1899-1900 era. Um, and from there then built it up into a chain of 12 or 14 stores. What's interesting is he got the chain built up to 12 or 14 stores in about 1904 mm -hmm. and decided to sell. Uh, the Woolworth Company wanted to move into the Pittsburgh mm -hmm. market and they acquired the G.C. Murphy Company. Now the legend goes and, and I have not found anything in writing to substantiate this, but it's been repeated often enough that I'm taking it as strong circumstantial evidence anyways, that his agreement with the Woolworth Company said he could not open any more five and ten cent stores when he sold mm -hmm. this company to them. But the agreement didn't say that he couldn't open five and ten and twenty-five cent stores. Mm -hmm. So within two years he was back in business with a five, mm -hmm. ten, and twenty-five cent store and he started putting them back in this very same towns mm -hmm. in western Pennsylvania where his old stores had been sometimes competing with the Woolworth mm. store just a few doors away that of course two years earlier had been right. a J.C. Murphy store. Right. Right. George Murphy unfortunately didn't get a chance to enjoy his success because within a couple of years he was again back up to 12 or 14 of these mm -hmm. 5, 10 and 25 cent stores. Um, but he became sick in 1909 and died, mm -hmm. a relatively young man, I think he was 41 or 42 years old at the mm -hmm. time. Um, and the company sort of W didn't quite go into receivership, but the bank took ownership. Mm -hmm. They tried to auction it off and they found no takers um, and it was really floundering for a while until two other dime store executives came in mm -hmm. who had worked at the McCrory Company and then bought it off of the banks. And that's what really then turned into the G.C. Murphy Company that would eventually operate in 24 different states. Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania you had a lot of these boom towns and McKeesport was one of them, Duquesne, Homestead, that you know, sort of over the period of 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. as the steel mm -hmm. mills developed, you know, the population exploded. So there was fertile territory that was unserved by retailers. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, when you did have retail in western Pennsylvania, a lot of times it was a company store. It was mm -hmm. owned by mm -hmm. the mill or the foundry or the coal mine. And sometimes miners, of course, were paid in scrip that they mm -hmm. could only redeem right. at the company store. Well, along comes this G.C. Murphy company, which, you know, all of a sudden now the merchandise is clearly marked prices. Mm -hmm. It's not affiliated with the mine or the mm -hmm. steel mill or, or whatever the major industry in town is. It's independent, and it's bringing in brand name merchandise from the East Coast and later on from mm -hmm. overseas even at prices that, uh, that the local right. stores... Right couldn't match and that with merchandise that they weren't offering. I grew up uh, 
in the 1970s seeing Murphy's, some in downtowns, some out in the suburbs. Obviously, they had grown by leaps and bounds by then by, what, hundreds of stores? They had, uh, at their peak, about 520, 530 stores. Mm -hmm. They were in 24 states, uh, mostly east of the Mississippi, although they did have a few up in Minnesota, up in the St. Paul area. Um, so yes, they had grown. Um, I wouldn't know if I would say by leaps and bounds, though. They were very much cautious through most of their history about mm -hmm. growing. Uh, they would open a store, let's say, and this is a hypothetical, they would open a store in Charleroi, and then they would open another store in Manesson, and then they would open another mm -hmm. store a little bit down the river in mm -hmm. California, and then they would open another store a little bit down the river in Brownsville, and then they would go back and they would start backfilling in. Mm -hmm. The idea being that these stores could share distribution right. costs, they could share advertising costs. So they, until the 1950s and 60s, they really didn't have mm -hmm. leaps and bounds. They, they, they grew their distribution chain slowly. Right. It's right. very similar to the way that Walmart actually grew mm -hmm. then in the late 70s and early 80s, where they would go into small towns and then they would go to the next small town and the next small town. Right. You know, if you, if you lost a button or you needed some thread, you always knew that you could run into Murphy's and get thread. Um, so I've been buying this yarn up and people keep asking me, well, are you knitting sweaters with this or what are you doing? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just buying it because it's, it's Murphy's, uh, Murphy's brand right. yarn made, in, uh, or made right. for J.C. Murphy Company. Yes. We have uh, work clothing. I mentioned that they were in all these, um, all, mm. all, all these mill towns. The big Murph. The big Murph overalls mm. were, were a big seller. Later on, Murphy's tried to get into more fashionable mm -hmm. merchandise, mm -hmm. but it was really the, 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 the work clothes, the working class stuff mm -hmm. that they were strongest in. And, and if you're going to have a big Murph uh, work shirt, obviously sure. you want to have some big Murph underwear, underwear right. To, right. <laughs> to have under it. People ask me, was it like a Dollar General or was it like mm -hmm. a Big Lots? No, not really, because those stores sell closeout items. Mm -hmm. At Murphy's, you were required to have certain staple items mm -hmm. at all times. White paper, white envelopes, mm -hmm. uh, peppermint lifesavers, mm -hmm. light bulbs, th certain kinds right. of thread that you were expected to have in stock. That um, was an ex It was expensive to run a store oh, like sure. that, but in a neighborhood or something, it made it very valuable because mm -hmm. you always knew that these things were going right. to be available. They struggled at first. Uh, they were very much interested, the Kresge Company, the SS Kresge Company, which was another one of these mm -hmm. five and ten retailers, had converted itself in the 1960s to a high volume discount department store, which we know as Kmart. Mm -hmm. And everybody was trying to imitate Kmart in the 1960s. And the difference again being these five and ten cent stores located in neighborhoods sold stationery and candy mm -hmm. and needles and thread right. and small objects. These Kmart stores could sell televisions and sofas and lawnmowers and these large right. durable goods. Murphy's waited in the 1960s. They were kind of unsure that this discount department mm -hmm. store idea was going to take off. Well, it was clear by the end of the 1960s that it had taken off in a very big way mm -hmm. and that Kmart, which had been about the size, or Kresge, which had been about the size of the G.C. Murphy company 10 years earlier, was now mm -hmm. four or five times larger and that Murphy's needed to do something to get into mm -hmm. this game. So in the 1970s, this is a long answer to what was a short question, in the 1970s, Murphy's went out and tried to open its own discount department mm -hmm. stores called the Murphy's Mart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they were now buying property and buying real estate in 1970s prices where Kmart mm -hmm. had been buying at 1950s and 60s prices, and that got them into some trouble. They also bought some discount chains or some discount stores off of other chains that had failed. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, there were reasons why these stores mm -hmm. had failed. Um, so it took them some time in the 1970s to sort of digest all these new acquisitions mm -hmm. and also to differentiate the difference between what was a department store mm -hmm. and what was a five and ten cent store. By the time they did that, 1978, 1979, they were on a pretty good footing. And uh, 81, 82, 83, which is really where the, their core markets were, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, these industrial states in the mid-Atlantic region, were all really being very hard hit by the contraction of the steel sure. industry and the auto industry. Uh, and of course coal mining, which was dependent on the steel industry, was also hurting at the time. But Murphy's was reporting record profits mm -hmm. in those years because they had pruned away mm -hmm. some of these underperforming stores. So actually they went through a very rough patch in the 1970s, but by the early 1980s we're, we're doing pretty good. So 25 years ago they're doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, 
why aren't they doing well now? Before World War II, when there weren't a lot of career opportunities for women, mm -hmm. there were career opportunities at the G.C. Murphy Company if you wanted to work outside of the home. So a lot, a lot of women, the, the backbone of the G.C. Murphy Company was really the women who worked for them in the stores, some of whom stayed there for 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. The downside of it was that there weren't a lot of management opportunities for them. So they would hire kids fresh out of high school or college, men, mm -hmm. as assistant managers and managers, and sometimes a, a woman who had been there for 30 years was still mm -hmm. sure. running a cash register or stocking yeah. shelves. It wasn't until after World War II that sure. they started sure. to pull them up into management, too. Sure. Well, I know all those uh, wonderful stories are in there, and uh, do you also have things online, too, images? As a matter of fact, yes. We have a website at, at www.gcmurphy.org, okay. or if they do a Google search or a Bing search, they're going to mm -hmm. come up with, for GC Murphy, they'll come up with it. Um, we have continued to get things. People scan them in. People find them all the time. I got an email just a few months ago from a soldier in Iraq. <laughs> who um, had received a, basically a care package from the states that had all this stuff in it, and, and it was a package of never used G.C. Murphy handkerchiefs. Um, and he got online from uh, uh, Bagram Air Base, I think, and found the G.C. Uh -huh. Murphy website and said, just wanted to let you know that these handkerchiefs are being used right now in our unit in, I in Iraq. Um, so people continue to send us mm -hmm. stuff. Um, just like Murphy's, we throw nothing away, uh, so it's going to the McKeesport Heritage Center, uh, which is there in the, what had been the headquarters city of the G.C. Sure. Murphy Company. It's the museum and archives, and um, anything we have is ultimately going to them, so it will be on display, and if somebody wants to write a follow-up book someday, hopefully the information will be there for them. Well, you've already uh, uh, covered lots of bases and I think uh, intrigued a lot of uh, listeners to learn more. So. Thank you once again for being with us, Jason. Thank you, Brian.